we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem, lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard to reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief. And we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. Well, amen. We are seeking to reach the nations together. With that said, we're in the process of receiving, collecting uh, that missions offering. Our campus goal, $750. Thank you to those who've already given. And if you have the ability to give, may the Lord bless you for that. We give that they may go around the world and reach folk for Christ. My privilege today to introduce our chapel speaker, Dr. Roy Lucas, and longtime New Testament professor uh, here at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. And so uh, it's good to have him back on campus, back in this room. I told him I could remember the last sermon that I heard him preach in this place. And uh, he and I went to Israel together in 2010. I have to tell this story real quick. And so I roomed with him in Israel, and so it had been a long flight. I met the group there. Flew in separate with them. And uh, sometime early morning on that first night, he gets up, gets a shower, gets his clothes on. I roll over, stretch, say, is it time? He said, I think so. Now, I put the emphasis on I think so. And so uh, I get ready. We go to walk out the door to go to breakfast, meet the rest of the group. And out across the Mediterranean Sea, it is pitch black dark. He never looked at his watch. He simply saw a light shining through the window, which happened to be a light outside our room, and he thought the sun was coming up. And so he looked, and it was only like 3 a.m. And so we tried to go back to sleep, and then had to get up and do it all over again. So I'll never forget that. I was already jet lagged, and, uh, but hey, it was part of the experience. But I love this brother. Thank God for him, great preacher of the word of the Lord. Let's pray together, and uh, we'll get into worshiping God. Father, we praise your holy name, Father. We thank you for who you are and for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. We thank you, Father, for the sacred ground. Lord, we thank you for all the students, faculty, and staff who have assembled together here. Lord, in light of your calling that you placed on our life, we pray, Father, that you would bless this worship time. May you be honored and glorified by the sacrifice of praise that is upon our lips. Father, may you just open our hearts and our minds to your word. Speak into our lives today that we could be strengthened for this journey we are on called life. Lord, may you receive the honor and the glory for it all in Jesus name. Amen. Well, amen. Clear Creek, it's great to be back with you again. Let's stand together and worship our Savior. Like a cloud, 
going to enter into our time of prayer. So sitting, standing, or come to this altar, let us go before the throne in prayer this morning. Christ the solid 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more gracious heavenly father we thank you for that mercy god we don't deserve it but you sent your one and only son jesus christ to die on that cross for our sins so that we can say that yes our sins are many forgive us of those sins lord and view us through the lens of jesus christ's blood so that we can stand before you and worship you for all eternity and god i pray that we boldly go out lord and declare that glorious gospel message for years to come and now lord i pray for brother um 
Lucas, as he comes now and he preaches your word, and Lord, as we worship through your word, God, come on him boldly. Let us leave your change not the same as the way we came in, and we'll give you and you alone the glory. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray this. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. It's good to see you and to be here. This is uh, where I spent uh, 18 years of my life. I enjoyed being here and uh, getting to see some of my former faculty and even some former uh, staff. You may not be aware of it, but your, uh, your new president or president-elect uh, has actually was a student of mine twice. He was a student of mine here uh, when he was doing his bachelor's degree. And then I was his uh, D-Men mentor through Liberty University and uh, helped him earn that uh, D-Men degree. And I don't know which was harder, getting his bachelor's degree. Second Timothy, Second Timothy, <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 and following. If you will stand with me as we read God's Word. <clears throat> I was reading out of the uh, newspaper, I'd let you stay seated. But this is God's word, and I think it's worthy of our, our respect. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 9. <clears throat> Paul writes to Timothy and says, Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. And when you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, pray that this morning you would take your word Encourage us, Father, challenge us, and uh, help us to be more like Christ. Father, may, uh, may you help me communicate clearly what you've laid upon my heart. And Father, we'll pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You want to keep your Bibles open to 2 Timothy as we go through this. I'm going to be walking you through 2 Timothy. <clears throat> but uh, Paul said, make every effort to come before winter. How alone he felt that morning. His lungs burned from the stifling smells of humanity in the dark, depressing dungeon where he sat with his legs crossed under his body on a very thin mattress that was given to him for a bed. He hoped he might get used to the stench of the dungeon, but every breath was a reminder of death that was awaiting him. A couple of days before the Roman soldiers had lassoed a rope around him and lowered him down into the dungeon. When he touched the floor, he went on all four, spraddled out. It seems as if the floor was, uh, was slick and, and he, he fell. His hands hit the floor and he, he raised back up, catching himself as quickly as he could. The stench was horrible. He looked at his hands the best he could. It was like he had the, uh, the bottom part, palms of his hands were covered with this, this putrid stuff. It was like a latex glove. He couldn't get it off. The apostle Paul finally managed to get himself situated and straightened up. The filth under his sandals was disgusting, smelling of that putrefying smell of like a fish, rotten potato, or even aged cabbage. He rubbed his palms together. He rubbed his palms against what would be that mattress of his. Couldn't get rid of it. And the darkness. The darkness brings on depression. Darkness that hung in the front of his eyes like a black sheet. He could barely eke out an image of a small man-sized hole in the roof of the dungeon that he was in. The little glimmer of light that came through that hole allowed him to see several other prisoners that were in the room with him. He fumbled around until he found a small candle, the, the instruments he needed to light that candle and lit that candle. The morning dampness of that dungeon weaved its way through his outer garments, 
The ice cold water began to seep against his back and, and, and down like sweat from the heat of the sun. He feels a shiver roll through his body from his neck down his spine into his feet. His friends described him as a man small of stature. His hair was balding, his legs were crooked, but he was in a good state of health, his friend said. His eyebrows met in the middle, and he had a nose that was somewhat crooked. Now, in his day, that description would have put him in good company. In his day, most of the Roman generals did not uh, like to have a lot of hair. Their nose were rather protruding, and their eyebrows tended to come together. Matter of fact, we're told that Caesar Augustus was somewhat described in that same way. And so Paul may have felt that, you know, he was from royalty himself because of the way he looked. But he finds himself in this dungeon, in this dark place, this place that he is alone. He wondered, would this be the day? The day of his execution. You see, he knew he had no illusion that the Romans planned on keeping him in this dungeon very long. That was not their practice. There was no such a practice as a, a life sentence. For the Romans, it's short and it's quick. He knew that within a few days, at most a few weeks, he would be executed. But he's hoping He's hoping Caesar will see him again and pardon him from what he's been charged with. And so with, with, with knowing that his time could be, could be close, he knew a few things. He knew, first of all, he wouldn't die on a cross. He was a Roman citizen. He wouldn't die like Christ and like Peter would be according to tradition. Probably what would happen to him, he would be beheaded. And the Romans would do a couple of ways to behead a man. Uh, oftentimes, they would just take uh, the, uh, the prison guards. They would take them out and just use the, the axe, and that would be it. But for special prisoners, they would actually bring in Roman uh, uh, men that were, were professionals at beheading, and a centurion would stand by to make sure the execution happened. And Paul, I think, felt that was how he would probably die. Was it his day? <clears throat> I think he fumbled around. He found a sheet of papyrus he'd been writing on, and, and he had protected it overnight to keep it from getting wet, found his pen and ink, and began to write uh, this letter. Finished writing this letter to his son in the ministry, young Timothy. He needs to ask Timothy to bring his cloaks and parchments with him when he comes to Rome. He found that papyrus, he unrolled it, and began to write, Make every effort to come to me soon, for I'm alone, except for Luke. Some have deserted me, others have been sent out on missionary tasks, but, but I'm alone. Timothy, I'm alone here in this dark place. Timothy, I need you here. That feeling of aloneness settled upon his human spirit as he writes those words alone. Where do you go for help when you're alone? He takes that pen in his hand and he dips the end of it into the black ink and he writes to Timothy. I think during this letter... If you read this letter carefully, especially in the Greek text, you will find there are 32 commands given in 2 Timothy. 32 commands, 32 imperatives. 15 are called present imperatives and 17 are aorist imperatives. You might say, what in the world does that mean? <clears throat> well, I will explain that to you as we go through these verses. The present imperative means that this is a general rule. This is something you need to do. This ought to become a habit. The present tense generally means it's a day-to-day -day activity. It's a moment-to-moment -moment activity that you need to be doing. And again, remember that he's writing to Timothy, his young minister, who will soon be left to himself to pastor a church. 
And friends, listen, this is practical advice for you and I if we're going to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are words that you and I need to keep close to our heart. Paul is writing probably his last letter to this young man and telling him, these are the things that you need to do. Now, thankful for you, I'm not going to preach all 32 of those commands. <clears throat> I have, have boiled those things down to five points. I'm going to try to move through these fairly quickly with you. But as you and I look at these commands, I want you to notice first of all, in, in verses one through th one, chapter 1, verse 13, look what he says in 113. He says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Look down to chapter 2 and verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descended of David according to my gospel. And then down to verse 14. Remind them of these things. Solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of hearers. He says, first of all, there's some things that you and I need to remember. We need to continually remember these things. Friends, listen, this is something that you need to take heart. I'd encourage you to take a mark them in your Bible, write it down. I need to remember this when I get on the field. Friends, I want to tell you, it gets easy to get distracted and it gets easy to be led astray because of all the demands as a pastor or a spiritual leader. There are some things that we must continue to remember day in and day out. And look what he says here. He says, retain the standard of sound words that you heard from me. Friends, what is, what is Paul telling Timothy here? Timothy, you stay to the book. You stay in the book. Friends, listen, we don't have the right to invent new doctrines and new teachings about Jesus Christ. We need to remember what we're told here. And friends, I'm going to tell you, you can't remember what you don't read. This is a Bible college, amen? And if there's any book we ought to be reading, it ought to be the Bible. If you don't read your textbooks, that's all right. But you must read the Word of God if you're going to remember it. If you're going to hide it in your heart, you have to read the Word of God. Now, I guess you all still do the uh, Bible test when they come in. And then you can take one and you go out. Yeah. Friends, I can tell you how to raise your score easily. Right. Read your Bible for four years. And I promise your score will go up. Just read your Bible. Pay attention while you're reading here. He, he says, he says, retain the sound words here, Timothy. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Just retain, keep, and have hold of those things that you have been taught. And then look what he goes on to say in 2 eight. He says, remember Jesus Christ. Friends, if you and I preach anything besides Jesus Christ, Paul said to the Galatians, let you be accursed. <clears throat> If you add to the doctrine of Christ, you're to be accursed. Anamathetized is the Greek word there. You're, you're to be brought to destruction so that God's glorified by your destruction. It's a serious thing to add or take away from the gospel of Christ here. And so he said, Timothy, you remember Jesus Christ. A couple of things to remember about him. First of all, the resurrection. Friends, listen, if we don't preach the resurrection, what can you preach? The resurrection reminds us that indeed we have hope for a future life. This isn't it, praise God. There's more life to come, a better life to come, and it's a physical bodily resurrection that Christ had. There, there was a, a Simon who in the early church was preaching that Christ was not raised from the dead, that it wasn't a, it wasn't a physical body. And we find that some of the early church fathers had to address that issue, and they addressed it. And oftentimes when you and I read the, uh, uh, the, the incarnation of Christ in Matthew and Luke's gospel, we want to emphasize the virgin birth. We want to emphasize the divinity of Christ. But friends, you understand that also tells us that he was born human, fully human. He's as man as you and I are men and women. He is as fully human as we are, and we have to preach that as well. This is what Paul says to Timothy. You remember the resurrection and the humanness of Jesus Christ. You can't get away from those things. We have to remember those things. He comes from the lineage of David. And if you study Matthew's uh, genealogy very closely, you realize 
that what, what he says first, he's from the genealogy of David and then Abraham. Chronologically backwards, but he has a reason for that, a theological reason. Christ took on humanity. We have to remember that. We have to remember what Paul is telling young Timothy here. And then he says in verse 14, remind them of these things, charge them with the presence of God, not to wrangle about words. <clears throat> now, I don't know how, what it's like here, but when I did my bachelor's degree at Oklahoma Baptist University and then went on to Southwestern Seminary, a lot of us like to gather either in the library or the student lounge and we would squabble over our doctrines. We would try to convince each other that we were right. And you know what it led to? Nothing. We didn't change each other's minds. <clears throat> actually, what, what it happens is just what Paul says here in verse 14. He says that it actually leads to the ruin of hearers. <clears throat> I like what Thomas Lee and, and Hank Griffin in their commentary on 2 Timothy says. He says, have you ever thought that word splitting whets the appetite for argument rather than for building commitment to the living God? Friends, if you and I are going to talk to each other, our words ought to build each other up. Our words ought to encourage us to be more Christ-like. Don't you agree? Our words ought to, ought to drive us closer to Christ rather than further away. It ought to bring us together more than it separates us. Paul says, remember this squabbling over words has two results. It will ruin those hearers and increase ungodly living. When we learn that our words have the power to destroy and hurt, we will learn how to temper what we say to one another. Whether we share the gospel with a lost man or with brothers and sisters in Christ, notice what he says. He says we are to do it in love. We're to do it in kindness. So the first thing is remember, remember some things. <clears throat> Second thing that Paul tells Timothy, he says continue to be separated. Look with me in chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. He says, now, flee from youthful lusts, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Flee youthful lust. Now, you might think that that's referring to, uh, the, the, you know, kind of uh, sensual kinds of things to run from, and it does to a degree, but it really means to flee from immaturity. Young people, often we are immature, aren't we? We, we? we often act immature. We think in immature ways. And so he says here, you need to flee from that kind of thing. To flee, that's a negative kind of concept. There's something you need to run away from. But then he says we need to pursue something. What is that? Pursue righteousness. We need to flee from that and pursue righteousness. What is that? It's a right relationship with God. You know, when you think about Timothy, we, we, we believe he's young. Many scholars think Timothy's in his 30s. But even as a believer, he's a young believer. He's still immature in a lot of things. And you think about uh, how, how Potiphar, uh, Potiphar's wife put, put the, the, the move on to, to, to Joseph. What did he do? He fled from that opportunity and left it. Friends, you and I need to flee from some things here. As young people, we are tempted. We're tempted to be selfish, self-centered, self-focused, stubborn, arrogant, and all-knowing. There was a time in my life, friends, you couldn't teach me anything. You know why? I already knew it. I already knew it. I had read the books, I had studied the, the, the professors, and I knew the answers. I've gotten older, I don't even know the questions anymore. 
Paul's telling Timothy here, avoid hot-headed answers and extended discussions of trivia that hinder effectiveness here. Young men can be characterized as showing partiality, intolerance, half-heartedness, unwarranted self-assurance. He says avoid those qualities, but pursue righteousness. Righteous is a right relationship with God. Righteous means that you're to be a man or a woman of integrity, truthfulness, fairness, and justice. He was to show faith, a sincere faith in God. He was to, to demonstrate love, a growing affection for others. Do you know what love is? Love is when I want what's best for you. And if you're seeking to destroy a brother or sister in Christ, I promise you, you are not loving them. You want what's best for them. You want to build them up. You want to encourage them. He says he's to seek for peace. That's genuine fellowship and harmony with other Christian believers. And after all, friends, you and I have Jesus Christ in common, don't we? You and I have the Holy Spirit of God living in us, dwelling in us. Doesn't it seem like to, to you that somehow that Spirit can provide unity and oneness among his, his people? He's refused those foolish and ignorant speculations. I like what one commentator says. He says, some questions are foolish and stupid. Amen? You all are quiet. <laughs> the fruit of continuing those discussions simply lead to more divisions and more quarrels. The cure for that, my friends, is to not listen to it. Walk away from it. Don't engage in those kinds of discussions. Now, friends, make sure Paul's not, he's not discouraging intelligent, probing theological discussions that prove to be fruitful, but he's saying don't get involved in those useless wrangling of recondite questions that divide and confuse. Separate yourself from that. What else do we need to be separated from? Look in chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. He says, men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these." If you have that kind of nature, if that's your kind of attitude, friends, Paul says, Timothy, you stay away from those people. These kinds of people were to avoid lovers of self. Verse 4, lovers of pleasure. That's where the heart of these people are. They love themselves and they love pleasure. But they don't have, you don't know that here it says they love God or the people of God. There's about 18 or 19 terms here. We're to avoid those. And again, remember, this is a present tense command. You're to continually, habitually avoid people that have those kinds of natures, those kinds of attitudes here. One commentator gives these condemning remarks. Listen to this, and I'm quoting. Why are Christians in America so comfortable? We, why are we so accepted and well-received? One of two things must be true. Either we live in a Christian culture that naturally provides a climate of acceptance and support, or we have accommodated ourselves to the value established by our non-Christian culture. <clears throat> he goes on to say, I don't find enough evidence to convince me that ours is a Christian culture. Our comfort and acceptance can only suggest that we have been tamed by the world around us, and we've acquiesced with the world's values much more than we realize or dare admit. If we're not separating ourselves from those kinds of people, then we have, have, we have engaged ourselves with that kind of conduct as well. And we're comfortable with it. Why is it that we can go to movies that bring shame to the Lord and it doesn't bother us? Why do we listen to music that's ungodly and it doesn't bother us? We are more like the culture than we are different. Friends, there's some things that we need to just separate ourselves from. Right. 
Now, what am I saying? We are indeed part of the world. You know, we're in it. But we don't have to act like it. We don't have to behave like it. We don't have to think like it. <clears throat> That's a few of the present tense things. <clears throat> As I move on, I want you to notice the third thing here, these aorist imperatives. Present tense says, this is what you need to do. Habitually do these things. Habitually remember certain things and avoid certain things. Separate yourself from certain things. But an aorist imperative says, this is what you need to do now. It's not just continually, but at this moment, you need to be doing these things. You need to know you're going to experience these things now. That, that's what the heiress in, uh, imperative says. It's a specific, definite, uh, decisive decision that you need to make. In 2 Timothy, he tells us that you and I need to expect hardship. Look what he says back over in verse 8. 2 verse Timothy, Timothy 1.8. <clears throat> Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Look over in chapter 2 and verse 3. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, believer, you might not be suffering hardship right now. <clears throat> But you go to that first church, it's going to come. It may not come the first week, the first month, the first year, but I promise you it's going to come. There's going to be somebody that will stand up and say, Pastor, I don't agree with you. I had a man at the church that I pastored <clears throat> said that anytime we had a business meeting and there was going to be a 100% vote, he would vote No. Because he didn't think there ought to ever be a 100% vote. Well, if we were going to vote for Jesus to be our pastor, would you vote no? He said, I would vote no. <clears throat> and he caused lots of friction and lots of heartache. <clears throat> I actually had some folks walk into my office before a business meeting one time. And we thought we were good friends with them. And they, they announced to me as I'm sitting at my desk, Tonight, we're going to recommend to the church that it dismiss you. How would you like to go to a business meeting knowing that was coming? Some of those that you trust the most, that you believe in the most. I remember going to a deacon's meeting, and one of the deacons in front of all the other deacons said, Pastor, I think it's time for you to go. <clears throat> Friends, hardship will come. Ministry is never easy and it's never convenient. I'm telling you the bad news because Paul warned Timothy that that was going to happen. He said that you need to endure some hardship here. <clears throat> and it may be because Timothy, as we know from other places, Timothy had, had the tendency to be timid. He's young. Maybe he was easily intimidated by those that were older than he is. And friends, I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's an intimidating thing to go into a deacon's meeting when you're 30 years old and everybody in there 60 or 70 years old. You've only been at ministry for a little while. You've only just got out of school. And they want to tell you how you do things. What do you do? <laughs> you remember that God called you there to be pastor. And you buck up. And you take a stand for Christ. You use wisdom and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you here. And I think the other thing is this. <clears throat> Just preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. And you know, Paul says here, Timothy, he says, I don't want you to be ashamed of me and my suffering. Timothy, he says, Timothy, I want you to share in my suffering. And friends, I'm going to tell you, you will, you will suffer in ministry. And that's why the friends that you make here at Clear Creek will be lifelong friends. Because you'll be able to call each other and share with each other, here's what I'm going through. Pray for me. I still have former students that call me and say, Dr. Lucas, I'm going through this. What can I do? I had answers for just about everything until COVID hit. 
I don't know what you do during COVID. <laughs> I never had to go through it as a pastor. <clears throat> but you think, you see, shame, shame comes when you put your faith in somebody or something and it disappoints you. That's shame. You put your faith and hope in a pastor or a professor and they disappoint you, then you're going to be shamed. Why? Because you trusted them. And Paul says to Timothy, don't be ashamed for me because I'm in prison. I'm in prison because I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Timothy, I want you to preach the gospel. And if you get put in prison, that's all right. Now, friends, some of you may find yourself in prison for preaching the gospel. Our nature seems, nation seems to be moving that direction. <clears throat> Paul reminds Timothy by joining him in suffering, that involves loyalty to Christ. And loyalty to Paul. Look at chapter, chapter 2, verse 3. Maybe Paul's or, or, or Timothy's reluctant to face hardships. Maybe he lacks courage to, to face those hardships. We don't know what he's going through, but Paul's is telling Timothy, he said, make up your mind today. Friends, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> don't wait until you're in that pressure to make a decision about if you're going to stay loyal to Christ, you make it today. Regardless of what comes, regardless of what I face, Christ is my Savior. He's my Lord. He's the one to put a call on me, and I'm going to stand for him regardless of what some man does to me. You make that decision today. Don't back down. Don't back away from it. And notice how Paul says he's supposed to do this as a good soldier. A good soldier. A good soldier is on duty how long? 24 hours, seven days a week, isn't he? He's ready to hear the general say, go or come. He's ready for the general to give him orders. He's ready to move out. He's ready to do whatever the general tells him to do. And so Paul says, Timothy, I want you to be that good soldier. When the Lord tells you to go, you go. When he tells you to stay, you stay. We have to be ready to serve under the general here even if it means death. I understand the excavations of Pompeii, they actually uncovered soldiers standing at guard. They stood there while that boiling hot lava came and consumed them. They would not move because the general had not given them permission to move. Friends, you and I need to be that way. Can I get personal with you? <clears throat> Can I ask you some questions? Are you under any hardship at the moment? What difficulties are you facing? I promise you that when you get out into the world of ministry, you won't be arguing over the things you did here. Those discussions you have here will be remote discussions. You're going to be under the thumb of powerful, influential leaders in the church who want to put you in your place. They'll seek to undermine your authority. Friend, when's the last time somebody slapped you in the face for your faith because of the gospel? When's the last time somebody required you to walk a mile because of your faith? When's the last time you had to love an enemy because they cursed you for your faith in Christ? Friends, expect hardships, okay? Mark it down. You get in ministry, you remember, Dr. Lucas told me in that chapel I was going to face these moments. Now, let me say something on the other side. There's no greater joy and reward than pastoring God's people. For every one that causes you that heartache, friends, there's going to be hundreds that step up next to you and walk with you and encourage you. There's always a bad sheep in the, in the fold somewhere, but the rest of the fold's good. So the, the, the next thing is uh, expect to work hard. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 14. He says, guard, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. He told Timothy, you're to, you're to, to guard that treasure. What's the treasure? It's the gospel. 
It's the gospel, friends. It's, it's the, about the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. We're to guard it. We're to protect it. That takes work. That deposit that Paul's talking about here, it, it's a treasure that you have to watch over. It's like, you know, the bank, they watch over your, your treasures. I don't have a lot of treasures in the bank, but I'm glad they're still watching over my little bit. But they watch over it. They protect it. They guard it. And friends, that's what you and I have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, I'm going to tell you there are kinds of, of false teachers and charlatans out in the world, and our church people are listening to them. They turn on TBN. They get on the Internet. They listen to these, and it sounds so good and so sweet. But friends, it's false. And our people aren't reading the Word of God. They're not studying the Word of God. And so they're sucked into that kind of stuff. It could be even that some of the papers that you write, you use heretical people if you're going to the Internet for your resources. And you just don't know it. <clears throat> Timothy used to keep a watch over, over the gospel here. Paul passed it to Timothy. Timothy's to watch it, pass it on to somebody else. Look in chapter 2 and verse 2. What's he say there? The things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach to others also. Friends, that's my life verse. <clears throat> I can remember a Dan Delaney who began to teach me and, and disciple me as a young boy, a young teenager. Remember going to uh, to college, and there was a, a a Dr. Holcomb and other professors that built into me. I went to seminary. There was a Dr. Lauren Cranford, who would meet with me, pray with me, encourage me. Uh, the, others that to, that were there that would just walk alongside you. Dr. Lacoste Munn, who helped me with my dissertation on Titus, they taught me. I taught a few of the folks that are here, and they're passing it on to the next generation. Four generations involved here. Your teacher, you, the ones that you teach, and the ones that they teach. <clears throat> That's real discipleship. Look in, in chapter 2, verse 15. <clears throat> What's Paul say here? Be diligent, present yourself approved of God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. <clears throat> this is helpful information for us. If you want to squabble over and cause confusion with your words, you can do that. But Paul says, Timothy, here's three things you ought to strive for. Make it your supreme ambition to obtain God's approval. You know what? It really doesn't matter. If your friend approves you, doesn't even matter if your professors approve you, but the one that you've got to really want approval for, from is God. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Secondly, try hard to show yourself a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. And that same workman is to be accurate in delivering the message of truth. <laughs> When I was in seminary, one of the last things I wanted to do was to go take an exam and fail it. <clears throat> I would have been ashamed. would have been embarrassed. So what did I do? I read what I was supposed to read. I, I studied what I was supposed to do. I memorized page after page after page of notes. And then the test came. <clears throat> I could flip those pages in my mind. Find the answers. <clears throat> Even argue with a professor one time about an answer that he counted wrong, and I took him to his notes and showed him where he was wrong with his answer. <clears throat> I didn't want to be ashamed. And so if you're here and, and you're, you're careless with your studies, careless with your reading, careless with how you study and prepare, prepare for exams, friends, you're not going to fulfill what, what we're told here. You have to work hard. Studying is hard work, isn't it? Come on now, y'all talk to me. Isn't it hard to study? <clears throat> when I got ready to go into the PhD program, a friend of mine gave me some advice. He said, if you're going to be in the PhD program, you're going to find this to be true. You're going to be at home reading and studying while your family's out playing. 
You're going to find yourself in the library while everybody else is at the gymnasium. You're going to find yourself uh, in, in, the, in the student center with a book open while everybody else is having a good time. Why? I want to hear Jesus tell me, well done, good and faithful servant. <clears throat> I took, I took every, all 32 of those imperatives and I parsed those things out. I made a list of them so I could preach this sermon. And I tell you, that doesn't come easy. That takes time. I don't want to be ashamed. And then look in chapter 2 and verse, chapter 4 and verse 2, and I'm going to try to wrap this up. <clears throat> he says, Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Friends, we are to preach the word. If you don't preach the word, it doesn't matter how you rebuke, how you exhort, how you reprove, if you're not preaching the word. And I, I'm preaching through uh, the book of Acts of the church. I'm doing an interim for, and the book of Acts is interesting because you look at the early church. You know what they did? They preached the word. Acts 2.41, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached 3,000 were saved. Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Acts 4.4, 4, Peter preached a second sermon and 5,000 were saved. I wish I could preach a sermon to 3,000 or 5,000 be saved. Acts 6, 7, the word of God continued to increase, number of disciples multiplied. Acts 12, 24, the word of God increased and multiplied. Acts 13, 49, the word of God was spread throughout the whole region. Acts 19, 20, the word of God continued to increase and prevail mightily. And he was to be in season and out of season. Now, what does that mean? It means you need to be prepared to share the gospel anytime you're called upon to do it. And I'm going to tell you, it's just like right now, I'm preaching the word because some of you want to hear it. But I'm preaching the word because some of you don't want to hear it too. I've been in church long enough to know who wants to be fed and who doesn't. <clears throat> but listen, I'm going to preach it anyway. You know why? I have faith that the word has the power to transform lives. And I'm the result of God doing something. I was sitting on the back pew, minding my own business. No one on the back pew. God couldn't get a hold of me when he called me to preach the gospel. The word has power to change whether we want to or not. He is to preach the word to be in season and out of season. Are you preparing? Are you working hard? Are you ready for hardship? Timothy says that's what we're to be. It's what Paul told Timothy. <clears throat> when Dr. Smith asked me to come preach, I asked myself, what, what is it that I wish somebody told me when I was where you're at? These are the words I wish somebody told me. I don't know where you're at this morning spiritually. <clears throat> I don't know what your needs are. But I'm going to ask our team to come and lead us in the, in the hymn of invitation. <clears throat> and maybe this morning you just need to come and just bend your knee and say, Lord, I've not been given it all. I'm not ready for hardship. I've not separated myself from some stuff. There's some stuff in my life that ought not be. There's some people in my life that I need to avoid. Maybe this morning you need to come and just spend a little bit of time at the altar, you and the Lord. Maybe you do it right where you're at. I know the Lord can do a work in your heart right where you're sitting, right where you're at. I don't have to see it. That's, that's not my business. But if you need to do business with the Lord this morning, so that one day you will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Will you do that? Scripture is very plain. Today is the day of salvation. He says, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. If I know anything about that verse, is you and I know when he speaks to us. I don't think it's ever a question, is it him speaking to me? The question is, is will I be obedient? Would you stand with me this morning? <clears throat> you come.
If you need to come, you can talk to Dr. Smith, myself, somebody this morning. If things aren't right between you and the Lord, you come get them right this morning. Father, we do surrender in this place today. Thank you for the challenge of your word. May your Holy Spirit take and just implant your word to the depths of our heart, to every crease and crevice. And may, Father, it continue, Father, just to, to, to grow, to life, Father, that we would just make application of it. That, Lord, as that text also speaks of, we would be vessels of honor rather than vessels of dishonor, Father. To you be the glory for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 